what's the other thing on the horizon for humans uh, in terms of the sun burning out, all those kinds of interesting cosmological threats to our yes. civilization? Well, I think uh, on the cosmological time scale, of course, it won't be humans because uh, uh, be something even, else, even yes. if evolution has gone no faster than Darwinian, and I would argue it will be faster than Darwinian in the future, uh, then um, we're thinking about six billion years before the sun dies. So any entities watching the death of the sun, if they're still around, they'd be as different from much as we are from slime mold or something, you know, uh, and yeah. uh, far more different still if they become electronic. So on that time scale, we just can't predict anything. But I think going back to um, uh, to, to the uh, human time scale, um, then um, uh, we've talked about whether there'll be people on Mars by the end of a century. And uh, even in these long perspectives, then indeed this century is very special because it may see the transition between purely flesh and blood entities to those which are sort of cyborgs. And, so, and that'll be a, an important transition in, um, um, in, in biology and complexity in this century. But of course, the other importance, and this has been the theme of a couple of my older books, is that um, this is the first century when one species namely our species, has the future of the planet in his hands. And that's because of uh, um, two types of uh, concerns. One is that there are more of us, we're more demanding of energy and resources, and therefore we are for the first time uh, uh, changing the whole planet through um, um, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and all those issues. This has never happened in the past because having enough humans have been much in power. So this is a, um, uh, an effect that's obviously is high on everyone's agenda now, and rightly so, because um, we, we've got to ensure that we leave a, a heritage that isn't eroded or damaged to future generations. Um, and so, so that's one class of threats. But there's another thing that worries me perhaps more than many people seem to worry, and that's the uh, threat of misuse of technology. Um, and so this is particularly because um, technologies empower even small groups of, of uh, malevolent people or indeed even careless people to create some effect which could cascade globally. And um, um, to take an example, um, a... Uh, a dangerous pathogen or pandemic. Um, I mean, my worst nightmare is that um, there could be um, some small group that uh, can engineer a virus to make it more virulent or more transmissible than a natural virus. This is so-called gain-of-function experiments, which were done on the flu virus 10 years ago and can be done for others. Um, and, of course, we now know from COVID-19 uh, that... Um, uh, our world is so interconnected that uh, a disaster in one part of the world can't be confined to that part and will spread globally. So it's possible for a, a few dissidents with expertise in biotech could create a global catastrophe of that kind. And also, I think um, uh, we need to worry about very large-scale disruption by cyber attacks. In fact, um, I quote in one of my books a 2012 report from the uh, American Pentagon uh, about the um, possibility of a state-level cyber attack on the electricity grid in the eastern United States, which is it could happen. And it says at, at the end of, of this chapter that this would merit a nuclear response. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty scary possibility. And that was 10 years ago. And I think now what would have needed a state actor then could be done perhaps by a small group empowered by AI. And so there's obviously been a... Um, an arms race between the uh, um, the cyber criminals and the cyber security people. Not clear which side is winning. But the, the main point is that as we become more dependent on more integrated systems, then uh, we get more vulnerable. And, uh, um, and, and, and so we have the knowledge, then the misuse of that knowledge becomes um, uh, more and more of a threat. And, and I'd say bio and cyber are, are the, the two biggest concerns. Um, and uh, if we depend too much on AI and complex systems, then um, just breakdowns, it may be that they, they break down. And um, um, 
even if it's an innocent breakdown, then it may be pretty hard to mend it. And just think how much worse the pandemic would have been if we'd lost the internet in the middle of it. You know, because we depended more than ever uh, for communication and everything else on 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 the internet and Zooms and all that. Um, and if that, if that had broken down, that would have made things far worse. And those are the kinds of threats that we, I think, need to be more energized and politicians need to be more energized um, to uh, minimize. And um, one of the things I've been doing in the last year um, through being a member of our part of our parliament is sort of, uh, um, I helped to instigate a committee to think more on better preparedness for um, extreme technological risks and things like that. So th they're a big concern in my, in my mind that uh, we've got to make sure that we um, can benefit from these um, uh, advances um, but safely, because um, uh, the stakes are getting higher, you know, the benefits are getting great, as we know, huge benefits from, from computers, but, but also huge downsides as well. And one of the things this war in Ukraine has shown, mm -hmm. one of the most terrifying things outside of the humanitarian crisis, is that, at least for me, I realized that the human capacity to initiate nuclear war is greater than I thought. I thought the yeah. lessons of the past have been learned. It seems that we hang on the brink of nuclear war with this conflict, like every single day, with just one mistake or bad actor or the actual leaders of the particular nations launching a nuclear strike, and all hell broke, breaks yes, loose. Yes. <laughs> so then add into that picture cyber attacks and so on that can uh, lead to, to confusion and chaos. And then out of that confusion, um, calculations are made such that uh, a nuclear launch is, a, a nuclear weapon is launched and it's, and then you're talking about, I, I mean, I don't, it directs probably 60, 70% of humans on earth are dead instantly. And then the rest, I mean, it's uh, basically 99% of the human population is wiped out in the period of well, it may five not years. Well, that bad, but it would be a devastation for civilization, of course. Um, and of course, you're quite right that this could happen very quickly um, because of uh, um, you know, uh, information coming in. And there's, a, there's hardly enough time for human um, collected and careful thought. And there have, there have been uh, recorded cases of false alarms, several where, um, where there have been suspected um, attacks from the other side. And uh, um, fortunately, they've been realized to be false alarms soon enough. But, but this could happen. And there's a new class of threats, actually, which in, in our center in Cambridge, people are thinking about, which is that um, um, the uh, command and control system of the nuclear weapons and the submarine fleet and all that um, is now more automated and uh, could be subject to cyber attacks. And that's an, a new threat which didn't exist um, 30 years ago. And so um, I think, indeed, it, it's, it's, we're in a sort of scary world, I think. Um, and uh, uh, it's because things happen faster and human beings aren't in such direct and immediate control because so much is delegated to machines um, and also because the world is so much more interconnected, uh, then uh, uh, some um, uh, local event can cascade globally in a way it never could in the past and much faster. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword because yeah. the inter interconnectedness brings, uh, um, brings a higher quality of life across a lot of metrics. Yeah, it can do, but of course, the, the, there again, I mean, if you think of supply chains where we get stuff from around the world, then um, one lesson we've learned is that there's a trade-off between resilience and efficiency, and it's resilient uh, to have uh, um, a, an inventory in stock and to depend on local supplies, whereas it's more efficient to have um, a long supply chains. But the risk there is that... Uh, a break in one link in one chain can screw up car production. This has already happened in the pandemic. So, so there's a trade-off. And there are examples. I mean, for instance, the other thing we learned was that uh, uh, it may be efficient to 
have 95% of your hospital intensive care beds occupied all the time, which has been the UK situation, whereas to do what the Germans do and always keep 20% of them free for an emergency is really a sensible precaution. And so I think um, we've probably learned a lot of lessons from COVID-19, and they would include um, rebalancing the trade-off between uh, resilience um, and efficiency. Boy, the the fact that COVID-19, a pandemic that could have been a lot, a lot worse, brought the world to its knees anyway. It could be far worse in terms of its uh, uh, fatality rate or something fatality like that. Fatality rate, yeah. Of course. yeah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the fact that that, I mean, it, it revealed so many flaws in our human institutions. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And, and I, I think you know, I'm rather pessimistic because um, uh, I do worry about the... Uh, the, the bad, bad actor or the small group who can produce catastrophe. Um, and um, uh, uh, if you imagine someone with access to the kind of equipment that's available in university labs or industrial labs, and they could create some dangerous pathogen, um, then even one such person is too many. And how can we stop that? Because uh, uh, it's true that you can uh, have regulations. I mean, academies are having meetings, etc., about how to regulate these new biological experiments, et cetera, make them safe. But even if you have all these regulations, then enforcing regulations is pretty hopeless. We can't enforce the tax laws globally. We can't enforce the drug laws globally. And so similarly, we can't readily enforce the um, uh, laws against uh, people doing these dangerous experiments even if all, all the governments say they should be prohibited. And so my my line on this is that uh, all nations are going to face a big trade-off between three things we value, um, uh, freedom, security, and privacy. And I think uh, um, different nations will uh, make that choice differently. Um, the Chinese would give up privacy and have more certainly more security, if not more liberty. Um, but I think uh, um, in in our countries, um, I think we're going to have to give up more privacy in the same way. That's a really interesting trade-off. Um, but there's also something about human nature here where I personally believe that all humans are capable of good and evil. And there's some aspect to which we can fight this by encouraging people, incentivizing people towards uh, the better angels of their nature. So uh, in order for a small group of people to create, to engineer deadly pathogens, Mm -hmm. you have to have people that for whatever trajectory took them in life, wanting to do that kind of thing. And if we can aggressively work on a world that sort of sees the beauty in everybody and encourages the flourishing of everybody in terms of mental health, in terms of meaning, in terms yeah. of all those kinds of things. That's one way to fight the development no. of um, uh, of weapons that can lead to atrocities. Yes, and I completely agree with that and to reduce the reason why people feel embittered. Yes. Um, um, but, but of course, we've got a long way to go to do that because uh, if you look at the present world, um, nearly everyone in Africa has reason to feel embittered because um, uh, their economic development is lagging behind most of the rest of the world and the prospect of getting out of uh, the poverty trap is uh, is rather bleak, especially as the population grows. Because, for instance, um, they can't develop like the Eastern Tigers by cheap manufacturing because robots are taking that over. Uh, so that they, were, they naturally feel embittered um, uh, by the inequality. And, of course... Um, what we need to have is some sort of mega version of the Marshall Plan that helped Europe in the post World War II era um, to enable Africa to develop. That would be um, not just an altruistic thing for Europe to do, but uh, in our own interest, because otherwise um, uh, those in Africa will feel massively disaffected. Um, and indeed, um, it's a manifestation of the excessive inequalities, the fact that the 2,000 richest people in the world have enough money to double the income of the bottom billion. Yeah. And, uh, and and that's uh, um, you know, an indictment of the ethics of the world. And this is where I've, ha- I've 
my friend Stephen Pinker and I have had some contact. We wrote joint articles on bio threats and all that. Um, but um, uh, he writes these books being very optimistic about quoting figures about how uh, um, life expectancy has gone up, infant mortality has gone down, literacy has gone up, and all those things, and he's quite right about that. Um, and so he says the world's getting getting better. And the, Do you disagree it, with your friend Stephen Pinker? Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I agree with those facts, okay? <laughs> but, but I think he misses out, he misses out part of the picture um, yeah. because um, there's a new class of, of threats which uh, um, hang over us now, which didn't hang over us in the past. And I would also question whether we have collectively improved our ethics at all because um, uh, let's think back to the Middle Ages. It's true that, as Pinker says, the average person was... Uh, uh, in a more miserable state than they are today on average um, for all the reasons he quantifies. That's that's fine. Um, but in the Middle Ages, there wasn't very much that could have been done to improve people's lot in life because of lack of knowledge and lack of science, etc. Um, so the gap between the way the world was, which is pretty miserable, and the way the world could have been, which wasn't all that much better, was fairly narrow. Whereas now, the gap between the way the world is and the way the world could be is far, far wider. And therefore, I think we are ethically um, more uh, um, at fault uh, in allowing this gap to get wider than it was in medieval times. And so I, I would very much question and dispute the idea that we are um, ethically um, in advance of our predecessors. That's a, collectively. a lot of interesting hypotheses in there. And I don't... there. It's a it's a fascinating question of how much is the size of that gap between the way the world is and the way the world could be is a reflection of our ethics, or maybe sometimes it's just a reflection of a very large number of people. Uh, like m maybe it's a, a technical challenge too. It's not just well uh, of our political systems, political systems. Yeah, like yeah. how many, and we're trying to figure this thing out. Like there's 20th century tried this thing that sounded really good on paper of collective, the communism type of things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ooh, turned out at least the way that was done there, uh, at least the atrocities and the suffering and the murder of tens of millions of people. Okay, so that didn't work, let's try democracy. And that seems to have a lot of flaws, but it seems to be the best thing we got so far. So we're trying to figure this out. As our technologies become more and more powerful, have the capacity to do a lot of good to the world, but also, unfortunately, have the capacity to destroy the entirety of the human civilization. And I think it's social media generally, uh, which uh, um, makes it harder to get a, a sort of moderate consensus because in the old days when people got their news filtered through responsible journalists in this country, the BBC and the main newspapers, etc., cetera, um, they would muffle the crazy extremes. Whereas now, of course, um, they're, they're on the internet, and if you click on them, you get something to the war extreme. And so I think we are, are seeing a sort of dangerous polarization, which I think is going to make all countries harder to govern, and that's something which I'm pessimistic about. So to push back, it is true that brilliant people like you highlighting the limitations of social media is making them realize the the stakes and the failings of social media companies, yeah. but at the same time, they're revealing the division. It's not like they're creating it, they're revealing it in part. And so that puts a lot of, uh, that puts the responsibility in, into the hands of social media and the opportunity in the hands of social media to alleviate some of that division. So it could, in the long arc of human history, result, so bringing some of those uh, divisions and the anger and the hatred to the surface so that we can talk about it. And as opposed to uh, disproportionately promoting it, actually just surfacing it so we can get over well, it. Well, you're assuming that the uh, the fat cats are more public spirited than the politicians. And I'm not sure about that. I think there's a lot of money to be made in being publicly spirited. I think there's a lot of money to be made in increasing the amount of love in the world, despite the sort of public perception that uh, all the social media companies' heads are interested in doing is making money. I think that may be true, but I just personally believe people being happy is a hell of a good business model. And so making 
as many people happy, helping them flourish in a long term way. That's a lot of way to make people. That's a good way to make. Well, money. I think on the other hand, I think guilt and shame are good motives to make you behave better in future. Okay, so that's my experience. Two together, my experience. Can work <laughs> from maybe in the political perspective, yeah. mm-hmm. certainly, certainly mm-hmm. is the case. Yeah. But it yeah. does make sense now that we can destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons, with engineered pandemics, and so on, that the aliens would show up. <laughs> that, like, if I was the, um, you know, had a leadership position, maybe as a scientist or otherwise in an alien civilization, and I would come upon Earth, I would try to watch from a distance. Mm-hmm. Do not interfere. Yeah. And I would start interfering when these life forms start becoming quite, that have the capacity to be destructive. And so, I mean, it's a, it is an interesting mm-hmm. question when people talk about UFO sightings and all those kinds of things. That at least these are benign aliens you're thinking of. Benign, yes. I mean, they Mm -hmm. benign, almost curious, almost um, partially as with all curiosity, partially selfish to try to observe: is there something interesting about this particular evolutionary system? Um, Because I'm sure, even to aliens, Earth is a curiosity. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's in this very special stage. You know, special, I mean, special, say, perhaps this, a very this century short, is very special yes. among the 45 million centuries the Earth experienced already. So yes. it is a very special time where they should be specially interested. But um, I think going back to the um, the politics, um, the other problem is uh, getting people who have short term concerns to care about the long term. By the long term, I now mean just uh, looking 30, or 30 years or so ahead. You know, I know people who've been scientific advisors to governments and things, and they may make these points, but of course they don't have much traction because, as we know very well, any politician has an urgent agenda of very worrying things to deal with, and so um, they aren't going to prioritize these issues which are um, longer longer term and less immediate and don't just concern their constituents, they concern distant parts of the world. Um, and so... Uh, I think I think um, what what we have to do is to um, um, uh, enlist charismatic individuals to convert the public. Because if the if the politicians know the public care about something, cl- climate change is an example, um, they, then uh, they they will make decisions which um, uh, uh, take cognizance of that. Um, and I think for that to happen, uh, then we do need some. Um, public individuals who are respected um, by everyone um, and who have a high profile. And in the climate context, well, I, I would say that I've mentioned four very disparate people who've had such a big effect in the last few years. One is Pope Francis, the other is David Attenborough, the other is Bill Gates, and the other is Greta Thornburg. And those four people have certainly had a big shift in public opinion. Um, and uh, 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 and even change the rhetoric of business, although how deep that is, I don't know. I, and so, the, yeah, uh, but, I, but but the, the, but but politicians yeah. um, uh, can't let these issues drop down off the agenda um, if if there's a public clamor, and it, it needs people like that to keep the public clamor going. To push back a little bit, so those four are very interesting, and I have deep respect for them. They have. Except David Attenborough. Uh, David Attenborough is really, I mean, everybody loves him. I mean, I can't say anything. But, the, you know, with Bill Gates and Greta, there is, that there there also has created a lot of division. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And this mm-hmm. is a big problem. So it's not just charismatic. I, I put that responsibility actually on the scientific community. And, and the, po- the Pope does too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and the politicians. So we need the charismatic leaders. And they're rare. Yeah, yeah. When you look at human history, those are the ones that make a difference. Those are the ones that, um, not deride, they they inspire the populace to think long term. The JFK, we do, we'll go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it is hard. <laughs> There's no discussion about like. Um, short-term political gains or any of that kind of stuff uh, in in the vision of going to the moon yeah, yeah. or going to Mars or taking on gigantic uh, 
uh, projects or taking on world hunger or taking on climate change or uh, mm -hmm. the education system, all those things that require long-term significant investment. That, that requires... But it's hard to find those people. And, yep. and incidentally, I think another problem, is, which is a downside of social media, is that um, uh, of younger people I know, um, the number who would contemplate a political career has gone down because of the, the pressures on them and their family from social media. Um, it's a hell of a job now. Um, and so I think we are all losers because the quality of people who choose that uh, path is, um, uh, is, is really dropping. And as we see by the quality of those who are in these top positions. That said, I think uh, the silver lining there is the quality of the competition actually is inspiring because it's it's it shows to you that there's a dire need of leaders which i think would be inspiring to young people to step into the yeah, yeah, fold yeah. Mm -hmm. i mean great leaders are not afraid of a little bit of, of a little bit of uh fire on social media so if you have you have a 20 year old kid now a 25 year old kid is seeing how the world respond, responded to the pandemic, seeing the geopolitical division over the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. seeing the brewing war between the West and China. We need great leaders and there's a hunger for them. And the time will come when 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 they step up. I, 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 I believe that. But also to add to your list of four, he doesn't get enough credit. I've been defending him in this conversation. Elon Musk, in yeah. terms of the fight in climate change, uh, but he also has led to a lot of division. But we, we need more <laughs> David Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I'm a fan. Um, uh, <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I've heard him described as a 21st century Brunel for his innovation, and, that, and that's true. But uh, um, <laughs> whether he's a, an ethical inspiration, I don't know. <laughs>